Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Robino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, DollarCollapse.com. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Well, we timed this pretty well, didn't we? As we were setting up the Fed announces that it raised interest rates at its March meeting. Um, and the markets loved it. Stocks went up, gold went up, and uh, let's see, did interest rates go up or down here? Interest rates went down. <laughs> so so this, this was a, viewed very positively by the markets. And as far as um, you and I have been able to tell, as we've been setting up, uh, there isn't any statement attached to the the increase in the interest rate that the market has seen and loved. Um, so we're still waiting for that. But the act of raising rates by a quarter of a point have been really well received by the financial markets so far today. And you know what? It could just be uh, a bit of relief that the Fed didn't raise by half a point because so many inflation stats and growth stats have been coming out lately that imply that we might even be overheating now, and uh, and maybe the Fed was going to try to get out in front of it. So it could be that the markets are just happy that the Fed is not going to stomp on this thing with dramatically higher interest rates in the short run. I don't know. Is the U.S. economy in any state to be stomped on? Well, it... it depends on the numbers that you look at. If you just look at the unemployment rate, you'd say, oh my God, yeah, they've got to raise interest rates dramatically because we're in the fours right now. But as pretty much everybody in the sound money community knows, those, those are kind of bogus numbers because they uh, they don't include all the people who have gotten disgusted and just quit looking for work. So the people out of the workforce in the U.S. Um, total something like 90 million right now. It's a gigantic number. And if you include those back into the unemployment number, then it's not nearly as favorable. It's more like 10% than 4%. Um, so that number, it depends on which version of it you look at. Same thing with inflation. You know, if you look at um, just the headline CPI number, it's been going up fairly aggressively in the last year, but a lot of that is because oil has bounced off of an incredibly known low level that it had hit the year before. And now that OPEC is at least attempting to control its output, um, oil has come back up, although it's, it's down a little bit lately, but that doesn't show up in the past few months' inflation numbers. Um, so you could look at that and say that inflation is picking back up. In, in all the developed countries, you know, Japan's inflation rate has gone from negative to positive, and um, Europe's is suddenly above the ECB's target. But the question is, how much of that is just oil returning to a more historically normal level? I don't know that either. <laughs> so it, it's not clear to policymakers what the right thing to do is now. Yellen has been wanting to raise interest rates at the Fed for quite a while. But I, I think that's more of her wanting to reload the gun than her being hawkish on inflation. She basically wants a higher interest rate so that the Fed has the power to cut interest rates in the next downturn. Because right now they don't have it. I mean, if interest rates are already at zero, how far can you cut them to uh, to stave off the next recession? And the answer is not very far. I mean, you, we've seen negative interest rates around the world, but only slightly negative. And they have come with market distortions that imply that there really is a zero bound, that you can't go much beyond, uh, unless you want to ban cash. So unless... The Fed wants to declare flat-out war on cash in the next recession and make, for instance, hundreds and fifties illegal, then they need higher interest rates now to be prepared to cut those rates to give them a little bit of ammo 
when the time comes. And so that's the Fed's rationale right now. They just want to reload their gun. And they're, they're slowly doing it, but they're also afraid that distorting the interest rate structure right now by raising short-term rates might tip us over into some kind of a financial crisis because we're just insanely leveraged, Jim. And you, you know, your listeners know this, that we've borrowed too much money over the past um, 30, 40 years and that that leverage creates a pretty huge risk for the global financial system. Uh, just derivatives, you know, if you look at interest rate derivatives, it's $300 trillion or whatever now, notional value, which means that somebody out there is on the hook for that much money or half that much money if interest rates were to spike. So you'd see a lot of hedge funds blowing up and then stiffing the, the counterparties on their derivatives and maybe a lot of those counterparties going bust. And and, and it, it really creates the uh, the possibility of a cascade failure of a big part of the financial system. Obviously, the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of Japan don't want to see that happen. So they're nervous about tightening the way they, they might have otherwise in past decades when the, the financial system was, was reasonably solid, was, wasn't overly leveraged. So now they really have to be careful, and they know that. <clears throat> and so they're, they're dithering and moving very slowly in order to um, to avoid spooking the markets. But at some point, they're, they're going to have to commit one way or the other. And I suspect that a year from now, they'll have committed it to the other direction, that they'll be easing again, because the, the system really is so highly leveraged that rising interest rates are an existential threat to the financial system as it's currently configured. Um, let interest rates rise a little bit from here, and we'll find out that that's the case. And then the central banks of the world will have to panic and, and go the other direction. So I, I think um, when you and I speak in the spring of 2018, the tone of the world is going to be very different. Is there any chance if Yellen decides that she's going to go on a rate hike spree through the rest of the year that President Trump would fire her? Yeah, he wants a weaker dollar, which is the opposite of what you get with rising interest rates, because he wants to generate growth and he wants to improve the terms of trade. Over the last few years, in effect, the U.S. has allowed itself to lose a battle in the currency war by seeing the dollar go up relative to the euro and the yen, because those two big countries are so highly leveraged and um, so fragile that they might not have been able to hold together if their currencies had remained strong. So they devalued their currencies, and the U.S. allowed it to happen in order to stabilize the Japanese economy and the Eurozone economy. And it, it kind of sort of helped, because it does help to have a, a weaker currency. It makes the stuff you're selling overseas cheaper. So you sell more. You make more money. You have more c cash flowing into your economy. Uh, and that comes at the expense of the trading partners whose currencies went up, and that's the U.S. this time around. And Trump ran against a strong dollar, in effect, in the campaign, and he would like to see it weaken, even though, it, you know, it's hard for the president to say, I want a weaker currency, because that's seen as a sign of failure, a weaker currency. But they want that. And if the Fed acts in ways to push up the value of the dollar, then, yeah, there's a very real possibility of a conflict between the executive branch and the Federal Reserve. Um, so who knows? I mean, that, that could be one more complexity in the U.S. political slash financial system going forward. And, you know, it's completely possible that Trump at some point could call for the ouster of Janet Yellen. I'm not sure how the, um, the terms of that job work. It's possible the president can just fire the, um, the head of the Fed, or it's possible that he can't until the term runs out, and then he can replace the person whose term was run out. I don't know. Um, either way, it's potentially really messy, as are so many things. <laughs> you, know, uh, you can look around and, and see the potential for conflict and for chaos in just about any, but any aspect of any part of the global financial system right now. We'll have more with John Rovino right after the break. 
Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. So the immediate reaction to the Fed hiking rates by 0.25% was that both gold and the equity markets went up. Is that unusual? Um, yeah, usually those two asset classes are negatively correlated, although it's not, it's not a perfect correlation. But um, when stocks go up, that means people are excited and optimistic as a general rule. And they, they tend not to care about a safe haven asset like gold when they feel that way. And then vice versa. When stocks go down, people are spooked. And they, they want to do something safe with their money. So they go to cash and to an extent they go to gold and silver. So those things tend to go up when stocks are going down. Well, for both asset classes to go up at the same time is frequently a sign that there's excess liquidity in the system. You know, the central banks of the world have just created too much money, and it's sloshing around out there, and it's kind of going everywhere. You know, for the the past um, few years, we've seen a, a version of that in the financial markets where bonds have gone up and stocks have gone up at the same time. Now, usually those two asset classes are, are inversely correlated, um, because if, if you're buying a bunch of bonds, that means you're nervous about the market and you want to be in something that's safe. It's going to pay you a little bit every month. It's not going to go way up, but it's not going to go way down. That's that's the bond portfolio. Stocks, you're willing to accept some risk in return for a big upside. So when stocks and bonds are going up at the same time, that's a sign that there's just a ton of money out there. <laughs> and it's it's got to go somewhere, so it's going into basically every major asset class at the same time. You know, include trophy real estate, fine art, and farmland, in that equation, which have all gone up lately, and and uh, you see that we've got this liquidity-driven bubble that has gone global out there. When everything is going up at the same time, the implication is that money is way too easy, and it has been way too easy. I mean, by definition, negative interest rates, that's, if there's a picture that symbolizes easy money, overly easy money, it's uh, the chart of interest rates going down to 2%, 1%, 0 and then negative 1%, which you see in Germany and Japan over the past few years. So money has been excessively easy, and it's flowing into a lot of different asset classes. And now what we're seeing with the Fed tightening here is one of the first trend changes in that process, where suddenly here's a, a major interest rate that's going back up. Uh, and, and you're also seeing some bond markets do the same thing. U.S. long-term interest rates are somewhat higher than they were six months ago. Italian bond rates have spiked. They've gone from a little over 1% 18 months ago to about 2.4% right now on the 10-year. Uh, so there are signs of tightening out there that, if they continue, will change the mindset of investors. Because right now everybody still thinks there's incredibly easy money and, and capital is easy to get a hold of and therefore spend it on whatever. Uh, when people see that interest rates are going up and have been going up for a while, they'll change their minds and decide that money is going to get tighter going forward and then they'll behave accordingly. Um, they'll sell their stocks. They'll either jump into bonds, depending on, on how this one goes this time. They'll jump into bonds and stabilize long-term interest rates, or they'll panic out of bonds also and cause long-term interest rates to spike um, as they pile into short-term rates, which they perceive to be less subject to fluctuations in, in general interest rates, and we'll have a financial crisis. You know, that's how stock market, bear markets 
happen. When you see instability in the big asset classes, then people panic. They don't want to hold these suddenly unstable assets anymore, and they fall. So that could come. Based on valuation, we're way overdue for that kind of a, a pullback in stocks. So just according to normal historical indicators, not even looking at the insane leverage in the system, just looking at valuation measures, which have been pretty good indicators of where, for instance, equities are going over the past 70 years, you'd say stocks are ready for a big fall. You know, we're, we're 1929, we're 1999 levels now. So if history still matters, we've got a nasty bear market ahead of us in equities. We'll have more with John Rubino right after this. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, a report just came out today that Canadian consumer debt rose by 6% over the past year. It's now $1.718 trillion dollars. 167% of what people bring in, a record high. Is this telling us that uh, people are just too much in love with their credit cards? Yeah, you guys have been spending up a storm lately, Jim. <laughs> and part of that is um, the recovery in oil prices, which is given a little bit of uh, confidence to consumers. And part of it is the real estate boom that you've got going. You know, Toronto, my God is in a, um, a, a flat-out bubble. Vancouver has been in one for quite a while. And a lot of that is outside money flowing into the Canadian economy. You know, that's that's Chinese people cashing out the, uh, the gains that they've made in the last few years in the Chinese market and shipping that cash out of the country into what they perceive to be safer assets, which are, you know, Vancouver condos. And that's, you know, that that's... Um, that's new money flowing into the Canadian economy, which presumably is then spent. You know, if you sell your condo for twice what you paid for it to a Chinese teenager <laughs> who's related in some way to somebody in the military hierarchy of China, you got a lot of extra money with which to play if you want to. You know, you can rent a place to live and then spend all that money. And it, it looks like there's an element of that happening. That's that's kind of how bubbles happen in general in financial markets. You, you see some kind of outside money flowing in. For instance, in Silicon Valley in the U.S., when little companies go public, that's everybody in the world sending money to the founders of that company who probably live in San Francisco or around there. And so the San Francisco economy benefits from global money flowing in. Well, Canada's got the same thing going on now because it's perceived to be a safe haven, at least from a real estate standpoint. And uh, that's dangerous for you guys because it, it creates financial instability that will come back to bite you. If you've got too much consumer debt and quite a bit of government debt, apparently, and then the money from China or Russia or wherever stops flowing in, which it has to eventually, then you're left with a bunch of incredibly overvalued properties that are either going to plunge in value and generate big losses for whoever ends up selling or um, a, a lot of defaults on the part of people who just can't pay their mortgages and stuff like that. You know, And then, then you'll drop into a recession. The Bank for International Settlements, by the way, just flagged Canada as a recession candidate here. So... So you've got some issues, and you know they're not your fault. <laughs> That's just uh, all that hot money floating around in the world flows into smaller markets every once in a while and destabilizes them. And I guess now maybe it's your turn. Well, the Bank of International Settlements has four key areas they look at if they're going to issue a warning, and Canada has hit three of the four. We're the only major industrialized nation to hit that. Not the kind of status you really want to have. Yeah. 
Well, it's fun while it lasts, you know, watching the value of your condo quintuple in five or six years, like uh, more than a few people in the uh, the Toronto and and Vancouver area have, have had happen. That's fun. And <laughs> now you got to pay the piper, though, it sounds like. Well, in Toronto now, they're looking at imposing a foreign buyer tax like they did in Greater Vancouver. By the way, the government in B.C. closed the barn door well after the cows, the chickens, the horses, the cats, the dogs, the rats and mice had left the field because prices had already fallen 25% by the time they did it. And the experts are telling me once the government decides to interfere in a real estate market, they usually use the wrong tools at the wrong time and just make everything worse. Well, yeah, when, when governments impose new and extreme regulations on a market, it's usually in response to something extreme that has already happened in the market. Because you don't do that in normal times. You, you do it when there's an emergency. And, yeah, the emergency is going to cause you trouble no matter what regulations have been imposed on the market. And frequently, as possibly in the case of the Vancouver market, it just makes things worse. Because, as you said, there was already a trend change in that market. Prices were already stabilizing in a lot of cases and falling in other cases and sales were down, et cetera, et cetera. And they probably would have continued in that direction regardless. But a, a new regulation that precludes a lot of people who might have otherwise bought means that the, the trend change is going to be more extreme. There, if there's going to be a fall in the price of Vancouver real estate, um, it's going to fall harder now than it would have otherwise. Um, not to say that it isn't reasonable to consider certain kinds of capital controls when you're a, a small market and there's a whole world of hot money flowing in and, and destabilizing the system. You know, I think it's reasonable to try to moderate those flows, but it's just really hard to do because it's hard to develop a political consensus until a crisis is imminent. And at that point, it's not clear what you should be doing because things might change on their own already. You know, it's just not easy to do. And really, very few smaller countries have successfully navigated an inflow and a subsequent outflow of hot money without it causing some kind of a crisis. Well, the B.C. government has sent a mixed message, putting a 15% foreign buyer tax on the greater Vancouver area and yet offering a mortgage helper of $37,500 for first-time home buyers. Now, what, you know, is this discrimination or are they saying it's okay to inflate the market, but it's okay if you're a local to pay more? Well, if, if you're trying to shift the calculus in a way that enables local people to buy, in other words, citizens of the country in which that real estate exists, uh, while trying to prevent foreigners who, who are, you know, they probably represent hot money that can be destabilizing. If you're trying to make it harder for the latter group to buy and easier for the first group to buy, there's, you know, there, there, there's a, a reasonable rationale for that. But doing it right is really hard. You know, it, it, it can cause more harm than good if you do it ineptly. And it's not clear in the moment when you've got really insufficient information because markets can change overnight and these long-term fund flows um, are, are just very hard to predict. Um, it's possible that you end up doing something with the best of intentions that actually makes your situation worse. You know, I, I don't have a solution for this. I just think it's it's really hard to know what's going to happen next with hot money flows because you, you never have complete information. If you're the government of a country that's seeing hot money in there doing stuff because uh, those flows just turn on a dime without any real signal and yeah it's tough <laughs> you know as any latin american or small asian country can tell you it's it's very tough and now canada which you know hasn't experienced this historically the way some place like Singapore or Korea or Brazil has experienced over and over again over the years, um, you know, you're finding out that it's a tough call what to do, whether you just let it happen and just accept the consequences or try to moderate it with the risk that what you do is going to make the situation even worse. John, thank you so much for chatting with us. Sure thing, Jim. 
My guest has been John Morbino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.